Good evening, everyone. So I really like that picture. It's not just because I did the drawing. Uh, it's also because I think it tells a lot about the brain and about our att att attention. And uh, see, this guy, I mean, obviously, this is a romantic setting, but this guy is not paying attention to his girlfriend. He's paying attention to his smartphone and to other aspects of his life. So this is a little bit puzzling and shocking because attention is a limited resource that the brain allocates only to what it estimates as the most relevant things, items or thoughts around. So in that case, this guy is really sending his girlfriend a very, very clear message. Uh, right now, you are not relevant. But what does it mean to be relevant? How does the brain evaluate what's relevant and what is not? Uh, this is actually the key question when it comes to understanding attention and to understanding why we actually get so often distracted. So if you wake up at 3 in the morning thinking about the problem at work, uh, this is because part of yourself is really evaluating that problem as very relevant. And that thought will capture and captivate your attention. But part of yourself also believes that you should drop that thought and go back to sleep to be fresh in the morning. So this contradiction tells us something very important about how the brain works and about our attention. In fact, there is division in ourselves. So when it comes to evaluating the relevance of items, thoughts, people, we are not single-minded. And since relevance is the primary criterion that we use to decide what we pay attention to, this is problematic and that explains why our attention so often wanders with very f little feeling of control over it. So see, we pay attention to what we believe or estimate to be relevant. But in fact, we are a collection of subsystems in the brain which often have very different opinions about what's relevant and what is not. So that's why neuroscience gets into the game because we now know the systems quite a bit. So I want you to look at that picture for a few seconds. Okay. Uh, now let's see how you moved your gaze around to explore the picture. So is there anybody here who explored the picture sequentially going from the top left corner to the bottom left, just like reading a text? I guess nobody. So that's really what I expected. Okay. So most of us would scan visually through the picture with little eye jumps called saccades and short fixations. And you will notice that those fixations are far from random. They would mostly target objects or items, or faces, and interesting ones. And we actually move our eyes around, you can see that, uh, three to four times a second on average, which means that every third of a second, our brain has to make a decision about where to look next. And it does so because of piece of neural circuitry right there at the back of our brain in the parietal lobe, which is able to very rapidly evaluate or identify virtually in one glance, the presence of interesting items around us. And it will communicate that information to other neurons able to move the eyes. So that generates what some researchers call a priority map. And the priority map is basically the equivalent, the brain equivalent of a touristic map showing must visit places. So unless you make a special effort not to move your eyes, your gaze pattern will we'll show the movement of your attention across the space. So just looking at those patterns can tell you a lot about the basics of attention. And we now know, with neuroscience, uh, we can learn three very interesting lessons about those maps and about attention. So lesson number one. Some items seem to be almost systematically included into the priority maps based on extremely rapid detectors for such items. So for instance, flashing lights. Think of an ambulance trying to pass you in the traffic. But also most more elaborate ones, such as faces or text. I don't know if anybody got, got the, the, the line right there. Anyway, so you can experience that the next time you walk into a metro station because you will feel really that pull of your attention and of your eyes to add ads on the, f uh, on the side with faces or smiley people and text and so on. Lesson number two. If you fixate just a little bit longer, about a tenth of a second longer, your map 
will change to adjust to your current interests. So let's say here I want to buy some earrings for my girlfriend. Um, so that's part of the explanation why our gaze paths are different from one person to another. We don't look always all of us at the same locations. Consequently, and that's lesson number three, the map can take into account what we like and what we don't like. And that's because of a system deep inside the brain, which is called the reward system, and which, take good which takes good note of what we're feeling in terms of pleasure and at every moment and associates it with what we're doing or perceiving. So this map will remember it and warn you the next time you're in the same situation. So it will encourage any behavior of approach toward what is rewarding. And of course, it will encourage the allocation of attention to it. So it's a very powerful, powerful force to, 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 to draw attention to some objects. That glass of wine, for instance. Remember, we're not so far from, from Beaujolais. Uh, lesson number four. So, fortunately, we can move our attention away from very, very salient um, events, I'd say. Uh, what this guy maybe should have done to avoid a um, nasty uh, conversation afterwards. Anyway, uh, this is because of the opposing action of a system that can resist the captivation of attention, and that system is called the executive system. It sits mostly in the front side of the brain, what is called the frontal lobe, right there, as you can see. So, I've reviewed so far three systems constantly trying to take control over our attention. So, there is what I would call the habit system, so hardwired circuitry, orienting attention according to fixed rules, um, sometimes learn through years of repeating the same behavior. Uh, then you have the reward system, orienting attention according to what we like and what we don't like. And then we have the executive system, which allocates attention in a more flexible manner to pursue our present voluntary goals. So it says maybe, I hope, listening to me right now. Okay, and everything I said applies to vision, but it also applies to other modalities as well, such as audition, touch, olfaction, and also to internal perceptions as well, such as that thought right now that maybe some of you might be better off, uh, better in a bar with friends, I don't know, rather than that conference, uh, especially since you can catch it on the internet. Um, okay. Okay, I really like the, 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 this example of just looking around because it's so simple. And you can really experience the forces, those forces of those three systems, really trying to, to capture and move your attention around uh, and your eye movements. And so I encourage you to do it. Maybe, maybe not now, but, but maybe after, after the conference. Anyway, uh, so let's go now to review a few more interesting features about those three systems. Parietal law. So close to the priority maps, you have another set of neurons, another region, uh, who basically remember what is it we do uh, when we see an object. So see, for instance, I would see a glass of water or a glass of wine, uh, each time, and then I would tend to take it and drink it. Or I would, take a, I would see a pencil, and I would take to move my right hand to take, grab it and to start writing. Okay. So those neurons basically keep a memory of what is it we do with familiar objects. Okay, just like that. Uh, so that, that's very useful. But another thing that they would do is that, imagine I see that glass of wine, so they would recognize it and encourage me to drink it. Uh, so basically, those neurons associate perceptions with actions. So what we have here is an extremely powerful system to constantly propose actions to our brain to interact with our env environment almost constantly. Um, so see, imagine I'm facing a table and there is that glass of wine. So I have those priority maps, neurons in the priority maps, will which tell me that there is a glass of wine and make sure I look at it. So I will look at the glass of wine. And once I look at it, those other neurons will say, oh, glass of wine, take it, drink it. So that's what I will do. So you don't, have ju you don't just have the capture of attention by the glass of wine. You have a destabilization of the entire behavior. Um, so how come we don't drink all the glasses that we see around? That's because of the opposing force of the executive system. But imagine I have a brain lesion right there, front side of my brain. Uh, that executive system will not be able to filter out propositions of actions which are stupid or, or silly. 
so I will do it. I will take the glass and drink it. And that happens in patients. You can observe it actually. So people would take the glass and drink it and take it and drink it again and again, even if they're not thirsty anymore, even if they don't like wine also. So, so this, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so that's in patients. But think about us. Uh, so I have no brain lesion, okay. Uh, but I can witness the same pattern of um, control by the environment in some situations where my executive system is busy while on the phone, for instance. I don't know if it's the same for you, but if, I, if there is a pencil nearby, I would tend to take it and, and draw those, those beautiful little drawings. Uh, I don't know, most people do that. Okay, so we really have a system at the backside of our brain proposing actions which is really there to make us, li act, make us act like a puppet controlled by our surrounding all the time. Uh, pay attention to it the next time. So sometimes it's very useful to avoid the car just uh, driving just right by us, but most of the time uh, it's, it's a major, major force of distraction, which for instance may be not so useful in the classroom. See those guys, uh, there's just uh, some noise outside the window. Okay, and of course, all this is reinforced by the action of the reward system. We always say, okay, go for it, wine, that's good, yes, yes, go for it, pay attention to it. Okay, good. And talking about the reward system, I'd like to mention two other properties of that system that were recently discovered and that I find extremely interesting. That system is very reactive to novelty and to information. What does that mean? That means that if, if I get from my cell phone an alert saying that something important is going on out there, um, like I got an SMS or a mail or a tweet, whatever, my reward system will very strongly encourage me to take, to take my smartphone and to look at it. Distraction again. And think for a moment. If I'm used to a very stimulating environment, such as, say, cool video game or or a nice TV show, we, you know, carefully designed to lock your attention. Um, so with a lot, of, con with a lot of, of novelty flowing in all the time. So novelty, information, novelty, and so on. So my, my reward system will get used to that pace of novelty. And when I shift to a more stable environment, say classroom, I will really get bored. And since I, I, I'm, I'm bored, we can expect from my reward system to trigger what is called novelty-seeking behavior, which is basically a tendency to shift attention around, so external events, but also internal ones, so that are thoughts, to actually reproduce that pace of stimulation of novelty that I had during my video game. So no wonder it's so difficult to stay focused. Okay, the executive system right there, it's the main force stabiliz stabilizing attention. It is right there, Without that system, our attention would be constantly carried away by the forces that I just described. And the way it works seems to follow rather simple principles. Say I intend to pay attention to something in particular. I have neurons right there, front side of my brain, will keep that intention in memory. And as long as they remain active, my intention will be present. Which means, um, which means that they will be able to filter between what fits with my intention and what doesn't. And also they will counter the proposal by the other two systems that don't match that intention. Stupid proposals. Uh, but it's very hard and very costly to get, to, to get those neurons to stay active for long. Um, so that explains why it's often so difficult to keep in mind and to an intention of being focused on one specific object. And the moment, the very moment their activity weakens, we get distracted. And everything would be quite simple if we had only one intention at a time, which is far from being the case. So think of all the objective goals that you have right now, short term, mid term, long term. Uh, I don't know, but so probably listening to me, I, I guess, uh, but also maybe you have to call back a friend and you have to make sure that you have something for dinner tonight too. So all those objectives are there and they're stored somewhere in, your exec in the exec executive system. And they participate in the decision process. Remember that we constantly make decisions. What shall I pay attention to now? Where, wh what shall I do now? What shall I do next? So they participate in that decision process. But that means some sort of consensus across those neurons. And if they fight, if they compete as they do, that would slow down that, that, that consensus and, and that, that matching 
uh, the matching will be will not appear, will not uh, will not occur. So what will happen if it's too slow? Because we have to be fast. Is that the proposals from other systems, from those other systems at the back of the brain and reward system, will take over? So again, we'll get distracted. So, okay. Uh, so in order to stay focused, what do you need? You need a very very strong executive system uh, with neurons which are able to stay active for a long time. Good. But that's not it. So for instance, in that case, uh, conditions just like fatigue or stress will impair the ability of your neurons to stay active. You will get distracted. Uh, what you can see on this slide, this guy is very, very tired. He should go to bed, but everything he's doing is just taking the remote and channel surfing. So that's what we do. We work system at its best. Now, we also need an undivided executive system. because uh, So that means one very clear intention at a time. Uh, as concrete as possible, and if possible, over the short term, maybe a few minutes at the most. Okay, so but that's not easy because often we often find ourselves chasing several rabbits at the same time. And I encourage you, if you have problems uh, uh, paying attention or being uh, being focused, to actually investigate a little bit, introspect to know whether you're not chasing several rabbits right now. So I review three systems uh, which are fighting for our attention, and since the brain is massively interconnected system, uh, those guys really compete with each other mostly to counterbalance their respective powers. So that means that uh, the brain is at war most of the time, war in the brain. And we can actually feel, feel that brain uh, in our subjective experience. That's, that's the feeling of being pulled apart, stress, and distractibility. But actually, if you, yeah, like this one. Uh, but if you know about those forces and neuroscience can really help us to do that, then actually you can start using those forces instead and move to what is called effortless attention, which is basically using those forces of those three systems all together to pay attention in the right direction, the same way seller would use the currents and the winds uh, to sell. And my conviction is that cognitive science is now, is now ripe to propose really real solutions to train attention. So little stories like this one could be told in schools uh, and be the seed for well-thought training program for attention. And I think that's especially important now where it's no longer clear who masters our attention, ourselves or our machines. Thank you.